Great. So, um, hello, Nicholas. Um, he's our speaker today while I'll be moderating uh, the Zoom meeting. Uh, Nicholas Cicero is a neuroscience doctoral uh, student enrolled in the graduate program for neuroscience at Boston University. He's also currently a visiting student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Our speaker's primary focus is on investigating the mechanisms underlying arousal states, particularly during sleep, with a specific emphasis on brainstem and subcortical control. His research concentrates mainly on uh, technological advancements, particularly the development of innovative uh, functional and structural MRI techniques. Um, in order to uh, obtain higher spatial and temporal resolution data in small brain regions. Uh, in addition to this scientific uh, involvement in neuroscience, uh, Nicholas engages in various uh, recreational activities, including playing and spectating sports, such as soccer and baseball, hiking, traveling, listening to indie rock music, which is honestly quite impressive, and reading crime fiction literature as well. Um, we prepared a very educated uh, expert uh, that will share a presentation on uh, uh, neuroscience and sleep. So I, I, I guess, uh, Nicholas, you could uh, proceed uh, for the round with your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the intro. Um, just to confirm, you guys can all see my uh, presentation, right? Oh, anyone yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, so before I start the talk, just if you guys have any questions during the session, feel free to put it in the Zoom chat. Um, I'll try my best to read it during the presentation and um, I'll try to answer them during the presentation. But if if there's a huge amount of questions, I might just save them for the end. Um, but yeah, please feel free to ask questions. All right. So um, as was mentioned, my name is Nicholas Cicero. You can just call me Nick. I'm currently a PhD student uh, in neuroscience at BU, and I put my email below in case anybody has questions after the fact. I, I welcome all questions, um, even after the presentation, so feel free to send an email or anything. Um, so before getting into the actual content, I wanted to just give a brief background of where I came from and my science journey to where I am today at BU. So I grew up um, in northern New Jersey in a town called Fairlawn. Um, kind of close to New York City. And then I went to college in upstate New York at Cornell University. And there I studied human development. Um, and then currently I'm at BU studying neuroscience. Um, I went straight from undergrad into grad school. And my lab at BU actually just um, switched to, it is transferring to MIT um, actually in a few months. So I'm still going to be a BU student, but I will also have a, a visiting student um, title at MIT. All right, so let's get into it. So sleep is a very, very big topic in neuroscience today. There's a lot of remaining questions about why we sleep, how we sleep, and all that sort of thing. So just a warning, this lecture kind of goes over a broad, a broad range of neuroscience topics and how we sleep and everything like that. Um, my expertise is more in human neuroimaging and human studies of sleep, so I'll probably focus mostly on that. But I try to kind of bring in biology and other aspects of sleep as well. So there's um, four main questions I wanted to discuss today in regards to sleep that I think might nicely kind of separate the lecture into, into four different chunks. So first, I wanted to answer and try to discuss the question of why is it that we sleep and why do we spend almost a third of our entire lives in a sleep state? Then I'm going to go into more of the mechanisms that neuroscientists believe control sleep um, and really the, the neural mechanisms that generate sleep states. I'll then talk about um, sleep disorders and what happens when sleep patterns and various aspects of sleeping behavior is unhealthy or dysregulated. Um, 
and as I hope to convince you, sleep is extremely important. And when it's not healthy, it can have very, very serious side effects on your life. And lastly, I'm going to finish off with some open questions in neuroscience in regards to sleep. Some of the current areas of research that are still going on with sleep. Um, and, and yeah, just kind of the where, where we are present day with sleep research. Um, all right, so let's get into it. So first, I'm going to dive into some of the ideas and science behind why we sleep and what the purpose of sleep is. So we sleep, and we know that, you know, this is a very common thing. We do it every day. Um, and babies often are the ones that sleep the most, but not just humans sleep. Other animals sleep, like dogs, cats. Really, most species engage in some sort of sleeping behavior. And because it's such a um, evolutionarily conserved behavior, it sort of goes without saying that sleep is extremely important for both our brains and our entire body's functioning. So what are some ideas that um, scientists have as to why it is that we spend so much of our life sleeping? First, and maybe the most obvious, is energy restoration. So in a given day, you'll expend much physical and mental energy, you know, doing your everyday work, if you work out, walking to and from a given place. Your body uses energy internally to digest food, to regulate your heart and lung function. <laughs> if someone's really good at my just meeting, thank you. Um, yeah, so every day you use a lot of energy, both in your brain and in your entire body. And being in a sleep state allows for your body and brain to be in a restful state to, to recuperate a lot of that expended energy during your day. So this is a kind of a seemingly obvious reason why we sleep. Another reason that neuroscientists especially have been, have been diving into in recent years is um, that the idea that we sleep to improve memory consolidation. So there's been a lot of interesting studies showing that after a nighttime of sleep, a lot of spatial and other types of memory that happen the day prior actually is strengthened. And then the day after, a lot of those memories can be shown to have been strengthened during a nighttime of sleep. And similar studies have shown that if you disrupt sleep, the following day memory performance actually is worsened. Um, the mechanisms that control this in the brain are really poorly understood, um, but a lot of research actually in sleep, especially in animal studies like in mice and rats, right now is going is trying to understand how how the brain improves memory consolidation during a sleep state. Next, during sleep, our our brain's waste clearance system actually is extremely um, is functioning kind of at its highest. I'm going to talk more about this in the next slide because the lab that I work in actually does a lot of work on this area. But essentially, during sleep, the system in our brain that controls waste clearance is functioning at its at its peak during sleep. Um, I'm going to go into that in the next few slides. And of course, there's many more reasons why we sleep. Some that we know, some that I think are still question marks in neuroscience. Um, but these are a few of the posited reasons why neuroscientists believe that we spend so much of our time sleeping. All right, so now I'm gonna dive into a bit more of the um, research into waste clearance and how sleep is actually a really important part of waste clearance. So many of you may know that um, your brain is not just sitting in an empty cavernous space that is your skull, but rather the brain is sitting in a pool of cerebrospinal fluid, um, CSF as it's known for short. Um, so in, the, in this GIF in the bottom right corner, this greenish blue color is simulating how CSF kind of ensheaths the entire brain uh, and, and the spinal cord, as well, spinal cord as well. CSF is really, really important, not just for ensuring that your brain is not bouncing into your skull, which would be extremely um, detrimental to your brain health, but CSF actually helps with um, the brain's sewage system. So a lot of proteins and enzymes and other materials that the brain uses, once they need to be degraded, 
they will enter these CSF spaces. And then the CSF fluid itself has a flow pattern to it. So it's not just stagnant like fluid, but it's actually moving around kind of in, in similar movement as this GIF. And that movement allows for the CSF fluid itself to drain away a lot of those, those waste products that are produced during um, a given day um, that, you, that you're living. Um, one example of some waste that is cleared is when your neurons release neurotransmitters, a, um, a decent amount of those neurotransmitters in that synaptic cleft, synaptic cleft will be broken down. And then some of that broken down um, neurotransmitter is then removed um, within the CSF system. During sleep, actually, this flow of CSF in the brain is extremely, extremely faster and more prominent than during an awake state. So this is a little um, figure that is, 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 is um, from a review paper that was discussing how CSF flow is greater during sleep. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of this graph, but essentially during an awake state, the actual CSF spaces, so for example, this ventricle here is much smaller and restrictive of CSF flow compared to sleep where these CSF spaces actually increase in size and the influx and removal of these waste products is drastically quickened and, and increased. In my lab, actually, um, I think I forgot to mention, but I'm in uh, Dr. Laura Lewis's lab at BU. Our lab um, a few years ago published a paper where we were actually able to use functional magnetic resonance imaging in humans to, to actually image and observe the CSF flow during sleep. So I'm not gonna go into all the details and nitty gritty of this graph, but essentially if you look at this bottom figure, this is a um, kind of activity time series of a CSF region in the brain. It's actually in this, in this small fourth ventricle space. Um, and this blue area is the time period when a subject was asleep and the red is when the subject is awake. And we see that this, this CSF activity is much higher amplitude and stronger than when they're awake. And there's a little a figure that um, comes from this paper where it's, this is showing the entire brain activity in red. And then in blue, this is the CSF flow during a nighttime of sleep. And you know this, this video is more just fun to look at because it's kind of visually appealing. But what this is showing is that during sleep, these areas that have CSF have much stronger um, fMRI signal, aka increased flow, than during an awake state. There's a lot more details that I could go into about this, um, and my lab is actively researching this. But I think there's there's two things about this that I wanted to mention and, and kind of drive home. One is that during sleep, this CSF system is functioning much, much faster and, and just overall greater than during an awake state. And two, we actually have tools now to investigate this in awake humans um, that I think a few years ago might, ha not ha might not have been as easily um, doable. All right, so now I'm gonna transition into the next part of the talk, which is gonna be more focused on the mechanisms behind sleep and trying to go into more of the neuroscience questions of you know, what, what brain regions are actually causing the entire brain to be in a sleep state. We know that when we're asleep, almost all of our brain changes its activity compared to when we're in a wake state. What is it that is actually causing this widespread shift in, in neural activity? So, most of you probably have, have known this from just, I don't know, biology classes or, or other classes in high school or college. But generally, when we fall asleep, we go through a very stereotyped cycle of sleep. So first, we often go into what is known as non-REM sleep, you go from an awake state to non-REM sleep. And then stage three and four is, is a deeper stage of sleep. 
And then you cycle back up through these light stages of non-REM before you get to REM sleep. REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep is typically when we are dreaming. And in a given nighttime of sleep, it's very common for this to look for this for this to be how our brain cycles through through sleep. Um, now, one question that a lot of scientists have tried to ask is is what is it that that causes these cycles? Um, why is it that it's always you know we go down to non REM and then REM and so forth and so on? It's still a pretty open question, but I think I always wanted to get this as a baseline for kind of the structure of human sleep. I, I think these two slides aren't in the best order. I'm gonna come back to the, the sleep cycles in a bit, but another cycle and rhythm that is really important for establishing sleep and wake states is our circadian rhythm. Um, so I'm sure many of you have also heard of circadian rhythms. Essentially, um, most mammals have a, an internal quote unquote clock um, which is their circadian rhythm that typically lasts about 24 hours. And this circadian rhythm is tightly um, or is strongly tied to the, um, the sun and, and kind of daylight such that different hormones and other things in our body are increasing and decreasing at very um, specific times in our day according to daytime and nighttime. So this is just an example I found on, on Google of a typical um, circadian rhythm with many of the hormones that are increasing and decreasing during this cycle. So as we wake up and fall, as we wake up and the sun rises, cortisol begins to increase. When we eat our first meal, insulin increases, our alertness and internal body function begins to activate and increase a lot more. Um, and then as the night begins to, or as the sun begins to set, a lot more things um, begin to unfold. A big one is melatonin begins to secrete here, which signals to your brain that it's soon time to go to bed. Um, and many other things um, throughout a given night will unfold. Um, there's a lot more detail I could have gone into with this, um, but this is kind of just the general idea that the circadian rhythm establishes our body's internal clock and a huge amount of brain and body function is tied to this rhythm. Um, I see a question in the chat um, in regards to how do we know or measure those stages of deep sleep. So I'll go into this a bit when I talk about my own dissertation work, but often the way that sleep stages are defined is with EEG. Um, so that's electrocardio cardiography or cord I've always read the actual word for it, but EEG, essentially it's the scalp electrodes that um, are often um, a typical human imaging method. Pretty much it's a way of measuring, yes, thank you for writing out the full acronym for EEG. Um, it measures the electrical um, rhythms from the cortex, and that is one way that we can define sleep stages. But I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a few slides. Um, right, so circadian rhythms really are, are extremely important for establishing this internal clock. So there's one study that I just wanted to talk about in regards to um, how important this circadian rhythm is. So this is a paper um, from a year ago where they had mice um, and they had them either in a control or disrupted circadian rhythm state. In the control group, they had these mice in a room that was on a very scheduled light dark schedule. So for the first 12 hours of the day, there would be light in the room. And then in, this, in the second half of the day, there would be dark. And it was a very regimented thing. So this is um, going in this direction, the number of days that these mice were, um, were tested. So these mice had extremely controlled circadian rhythm. In the disrupted circadian rhythm group, they would alter every single day the 12 hour period that they were um, in a dark or light state. Um, and they tested many different things after this. So for example, one thing they tested was anxiety behavior. I'm not gonna go into the details of the actual task they had these mice do, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have. 
And what they found here was that mice that had a disrupted circadian rhythm had increased anxiety-like behavior. They also tested spatial memory and found that the mice with disrupted circadian rhythm also had poor spatial memory. And then they also looked at the actual neurons in these mice brains. For example, in the prefrontal cortex, in the hippocampus, in the amygdala, and there was many different metrics in this paper that they computed, and essentially they showed that there was widespread neuronal differences in how these neurons were being shaped simply as a result of disrupted circadian rhythm. So, you know, there's a lot more research that exists, and there was a lot more to this paper, but I just wanted to include this as an example of having a disrupted circadian rhythm, so disrupted light cycle, can really impact many different things in your brain many cognitive functions that are vital to our everyday um, behavior. I see a few questions in the chat that I'm just going to quickly look through. Um, does the timing of circadian rhythms and hormone cycles remain the same among different age groups? Um, so I'm, I'm not familiar with the aging literature with circadian rhythms as well. Um, my guess would be that they, they do change because Older adults typically experience more sleep-related issues. Um, even healthy older adults experience sleep-related issues. So that's, that would be my guess. Um, um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you though. How come the cardiovascular and skeletal mus muscular strength is greatest at 5 p.m. when alertness is at its peak early in the day? So I think this has to do with um, more of the kind of um, like mental alertness compared to cardiovascular and muscle strength. So a lot of our internal machinery that's important for cognition and attention comes online early in the day. And then um, in terms of why cardiovascular and skeletal muscle strength peaks later, um, you know, I'm not very, I'm not sure about that exactly, but it might just be because of muscle use. Typically people are at work during that time. So my guess would be that maybe it's just something that we're not, we're not really using our physical muscles throughout the entire day and typically later in the day might be when it happens. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you than that. Um, I'm gonna save some of these questions just for the end, just so we have time. But um, if I don't answer them by the end, please feel free to um, ask again in the chat. Um, but just for time purposes, I wanna continue going. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk about some of the, the brain regions that are actually responsible for generating the widespread neural um, changes that happen when we fall asleep and when we transition between different sleep stages. This is actually the focus of my dissertation. So I know a bit more about it than circadian rhythm. So hopefully I can answer people's questions better than I just did. Um, uh, but yeah, so... A lot of um, research over the past decades has shown that the, the regions of the brain that are really important for controlling when we fall asleep and when we wake up are deep in the brain. Typically in the brainstem and subcortex um, are, are the regions that, that control sleep-wake states. There's, there's not a single region that controls sleep or wake, but rather there's a, a large group of brain regions that control sleep and wake. And this group of regions has been coined the Ascending Arousal Network, or AAN for short. This is actually a GIF of my own brain from an MRI scan. Um, as a grad student in a lab that does MRIs, I go in there probably like once a week, twice a week. Um, and what I'm showing here is these regions that are colored are each an individual brain region that is part of this Ascending Arousal Network. Um, there's a lot more detail I could go into, but I think the big takeaway I want you all to have is that there's many regions that are part of this network. They're all very small and they're very deep in the brain. Part of the reason why I make a point of saying that they're deep in the brain is because these areas in the brain are a lot more conserved across species. You know, as, as humans evolve, typically in, in terms of neuroscience, we typically differentiated from other animals and other primates 
in that our cortex increased and began to evolve. But a lot of the deeper brain regions, such as in the brainstem and subcortex, did not change much between species. I want to now go in a bit more detail um, in terms of this network and how these regions are actually interacting together. So this is a very simplified diagram I made of all these different brain regions. Um, I'm sorry I don't have their actual full names here, but these are just the acronyms. Um, if I plot the connectivity diagram where each circle is one of those regions and then Solid lines connecting each region means that there are excitatory neurons between each. And then these dashed lines are inhibitory connections. First, I'm showing the connectivity diagram for the LC. This is the locus ceruleus, which is back here in the brainstem and is responsible for releasing norepinephrine throughout much of the brain. We can see that this one really, really small region has neurons that project throughout much of the brain, to the thalamus, to the cortex, really all over. Now, this is just one brain region's connectivity. When I show all the connectivity at the same time, it's overwhelming. I'm not even going to try to describe what's happening here. But I, the point I want to make here is that this network is extremely complicated. It's extremely interconnected and every single brain region is really interacting with each other to have this widespread influence on much of the brain. This complicated connectivity sort of makes sense because there is, since there's such widespread changes that happen when we sleep, it makes sense that a lot of things need to be happening to generate that, that widespread change. So Again, it's not just one region that causes us to sleep, but a whole set of regions that needs to then communicate with the rest of the brain. So this is you know, a, a bit simplified in terms of the, the regulation of sleep and wake states, but um, I guess the conclusion here is a lot of small brain regions are interacting together to have a widespread influence on the brain to influence our sleep-wake states. So now I, I wanted to hone in a little bit on my own dissertation work and talk in a bit of detail about how I'm actually going to be trying to study this network in humans. So what I do in my lab is we bring subjects, human subjects, into the lab um, at night, typically around their typical bedtime. And we ask that the day of the MRI scan that they avoid drinking coffee past 4 p.m., for example. So they're allowed to have their typical caffeine intake, but we restrict them from having caffeine at least six hours prior to the MRI scan. We then set up the EEG, which um, if anyone hasn't seen an EEG cap for, before, I'm sorry, it's a really small figure, but essentially it's about 128 little electrodes that are all on your scalp. This is really good for measuring the cortical rhythms that change during sleep. And then we start an MRI scan at the subject's bedtime and we have them try to fall asleep during the MRI scan, which lasts about four hours long. And I'm not gonna go into too many details, but essentially we have a specialized um, MRI sequence that can measure um, brain activity um, at a very high spatial resolution. So essentially in MRI, we measure from what is called a voxel. Essentially it's a three-dimensional pixel. And the size of that voxel determines the smallest area that you can get activity from. So we have a very, very small voxel size. Essentially we have a cube that's about a single millimeter big. And then we have hundreds of thousands of those throughout the entire brain to, to get as many regions as we can. So this is just an example of a kind of what, what our data actually looks like. So every single pixel on this screen has a single time series of activity that we can look at during a nighttime scan. And then 
based on those brain regions that I told you earlier that I'm interested in, we could look at the activity in those small brain regions and see during a nighttime scan what's happening. So this is an example result of the, um, the data that we have so far. So on the y on the x-axis is time in seconds, where time point zero is when somebody woke up. So they're asleep here, and then they wake up here. And these are just a bunch of brain regions from that network that I was talking about. And we can see that right when someone wakes up, and a few seconds prior, actually, these brain regions are all activating before somebody wakes up. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of what these arrows are and what bold signal is, but essentially we have now a measure in humans, healthy humans, they're not sedated, we don't have to stick anything into their head or brain, they just go inside the MRI machine and we can find that these really, really small brain regions activate when somebody wakes up, which is something that has been shown in animal research for decades. Um, a st the study that I'm doing now and it has has EEG. Um, so now we can not only we can look at not only when somebody wakes up, but also when they're going from an awake to a non-REM stage, a non-REM to an awake stage, a non-REM to REM, and so on. This isn't um, data from my lab. This is just a screenshot from another paper. But I just wanted to include it to show that with EEG, which gives us data like this to show us different brain rhythms that are changing with sleep and wake. We can also look at simultaneously at brain activity in these small regions to see what's happening. Um, I think there's some questions in the chat. So let me just look at that. So yeah, there's one question of, um, does this mean that we can predict when somebody's about to wake up with uh, sending arousal network activity? So one of the goals of my project is to see how best we can wake, how best we can predict a, um, a state or an arousal state change based on brain activity a few seconds before. From this result, I'm a little, little hesitant to say that it's predictive of awakening. It does suggest that these brain regions are activating earlier, but there's a lot more going on than what I'm showing here. Um, these, re these regions are also kind of even when even when somebody's asleep these regions are still active to a certain degree they just increase in activity when you wake up and when you're in certain states so we're trying to figure out metrics now to predict upcoming state changes but i wouldn't say that we're there yet and can confidently say that but i think one of the one of the goals of my project is to see if if we can predict an up, upcoming you know awakening or falling asleep based on these brain activities um, all right, and then the next question is, would lack of sleep affect neurotransmission, thus decrease brain activity? So that's a great question. Actually, there are two other grad students in my lab that are um, studying sleep deprivation. So what they do is they bring in, it's usually undergrads because they're most motivated by money, but um, we bring in undergrads into the lab and they usually stay awake for 30 plus hours. Um, and then at the end of those 30 hours, we then do an MRI scan to see how brain activity is functioning um, and, and how once they do fall asleep, what's happening. Um, so I don't, th I don't think there's actually any good answers yet in terms of what happens with neurotransmission and brain activity after deprived sleep. But I think I, there's definitely some involvement of neurotransmitters but there's no clean, concise answer yet as to what's actually going on. But that's a great question. Um, and I know I missed some questions, so I'll, I'll look back in the chat at the end of the um, lecture. All right, so this previous um, section, you know, was mostly talking about in a, in a typical healthy, quote unquote, normal um, sleep state or sleep stage, what's going on um, when we fall asleep and all that stuff. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about what happens when somebody has a sleep disorder, or if somebody has a separate disorder that also impacts sleep and what goes on there. Um, because there's so many sleep disorders, 
I'm not going to go into too much detail about each one, but I'm trying to just give a general overview of them. Um, but please, please ask questions if you have more or have more um, or want more detail. So these are a few of the very common sleep related disorders. I'm sure many of you have heard of these. Um, so first is insomnia. This is typically thought of as difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep the entire night. Importantly, insomnia isn't, it's not that people aren't tired or that they don't want to fall asleep. It's that when they try to fall asleep, they just, they really can't fall asleep. Um, there's some, some research that's trying to identify which regions within this ascending arousal network might be responsible for why insomniacs experience this behavior, but there's really not much that's, um, that's fully known yet. There are some drugs that um, can be prescribed to insomniacs to help them fall asleep, but of course, a lot of those drugs have a lot of side effects. So it's a, it's a very debilitating disorder, not being able to fall asleep. Um, let's see, the next one is narcolepsy, which is somewhat of the opposite of insomnia in some ways. So narcolepsy is characterized by excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy. For those that don't know, cataplexy is a, lo a sudden loss in muscle tone. So typically what happens in narcolepsy is people, will, people with narcolepsy will somewhat randomly um, fall asleep. Even if they're you know, standing up or doing something physical, they might suddenly fall asleep. Typically this is triggered by extreme emotions. So often people that study um, narcoleptic uh, patients will also give them, you know, an emotional task or something to, to see how different emotions might trigger narcoleptic attacks. Um, but again, it's, it's not actually very well known what's going on um, that causes this. Narcolepsy is actually a, a bit more studied than insomnia. And the lateral hypothalamus is thought to be degraded in narcoleptic patients, um, but how that interacts with emotions and cataplexy is still um, being, being very well studied. As you can imagine, having narcolepsy is extremely, extremely debilitating. Um, it's really hard to have a job when you randomly are falling asleep. You can't really drive a car. Anything that it's hard to think about, but anything during your day that if you were to randomly fall asleep might result in a disaster are things that people with narcolepsy really need to be cognizant about during their everyday life. So it can be, it can be very debilitating to have narcolepsy. Next is sleep apnea, um, which is actually a kind of a, a mix between a sleep disorder and a breathing disorder. So often sleep apnea is caused by an abnormal breathing pattern that might interrupt sleep. Um, typically people that snore a lot might, be, get, might get checked for sleep apnea. Um, this one is not as debilitating, but can still really impact your sleep quality. Because if you have trouble breathing during sleep, it might your body will wake you up to try and reset your breathing patterns. So people, people with sleep apnea often have very disrupted sleep cycles and don't get as much deep and kind of restorative sleep as, as what is needed for your brain. And then lastly, but there's many more that I'm not going to go through. Um, is restless leg syndrome. People typically think of restless leg syndrome as something that happens when you're, you know, awake and if somebody's like anxious and shaking their leg, leg. but actually restless leg syndrome is a sleep movement behavior that causes individuals to have an urge to move their body and their leg during sleep. Um, it's not that they're, you know, intentionally trying to move their leg, but it's more of a um, kind of involuntary movement of their leg which causes difficulty um, falling and staying asleep. Um, let's see, some questions came in. Um, have I done any studies on narcolepsy? No, I haven't, um, but there are a bunch of um, people in my lab who are planning on studying, studying sleep um, disordered populations such as narcolepsy. But currently in my lab, we only study um, healthy subjects. Um, is there any connection between short-term memory loss and insomnia? Um, I'm not actually, I'm not as well versed on the insomnia literature, but I, I see, so I, I think what you're getting at is since sleep is really important for memory consolidation, 
and insomniacs can sleep that this might lead to a memory issue. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't really read into the literature, but um, I see that the logic makes sense there. So I, I, I'm sure there's some literature on that. Um, okay, there's a bunch more questions. I'm gonna hopefully save these for the end, but um, please keep asking questions. All righty. So these are all disorders that if you go to the diagnostic criteria are listed as sleep disorders. I think um, something that, that shows how important sleep is, is the fact that a lot of other non-sleep disorders have a lot of side effects on sleep. So these are a list of many, or, or a few of the many disorders that actually are really strongly tied to sleep deficits. So in Alzheimer's disease, people that have Alzheimer's disease, this is typically thought to be you know, a memory disorder um, because of the severe neurodegeneration that occurs with Alzheimer's. But most patients that have Alzheimer's also have extremely deficient sleep schedules. They are often sleep deprived. Um, they don't have very typical sleep cycles. Um, and actually a recent study showed that in middle age, your sleep behavior and sleep quality was a very strong predictor for the eventual development of Alzheimer's disease. So it might be a predictor of Alzheimer's, it might be an outcome. It's not very well known yet exactly how sleep is related to Alzheimer's, but it certainly is, is involved. Um, major depressive disorder, so depression, is extremely, extremely um, impactful on sleep. Um, I think actually one of the diagnostic criteria for, de for depression is um, expressing drowsy, severe drowsiness or people or if you sleep a lot, that's often um, an indicator that you might have some sort of depressive episode or disorder. Um, and I think, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think a lot of the um, medications that are prescribed for depression also impact those deficient sleep behaviors. Um, and then I mean, I'm not going to go through all these, but just, you know, there's a lot of psychiatric and other disorders that are not explicitly sleep disorders, but that have a lot of impacts on sleep behavior. I think which goes to show that sleep is extremely important for us and, and, you know, our entire brain is involved in sleeping, that when other parts of our brain might experience a disorder, that can also impact sleep. Okay, a few more questions. Um, uh, why can't we sleep when we're hungry or stay asleep? Hmm. That's a good question. So I'm not really sure about like hunger research in relation to sleep, but my guess would be that there's kind of a, um, there's a conflict between your internal body expressing hunger and falling asleep. Obviously, when you're asleep, you're not eating, and a lot of the processes that control hunger are being inhibited. So if you're hungry, that might be at direct conflict with, with sleep behaviors. The next question is, um, how does having a traumatic event at night in the past, such as an earthquake, cause? Um, how does that cause having a permanent light sleep um, in an in individual? So I think your question's asking is, like, how does a traumatic event impact sleep and how might it cause permanent light sleep. So I'm not really sure what the mechanisms are, but I believe I believe it has to do with some of the neurotransmitter changes that happen in PTSD. Um, also, a lot of the regions that are in the ascending arousal network are also the regions that produce a lot of the neurotransmitters um, that are, that are um, kind of released throughout much of the brain. And in PTSD, many of these neurotransmitter systems um, are deficient. So that, that would be my guess as to why um, some of that might happen. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going. Sorry, I'm not answering all the questions, but thank you all for asking so many great questions. All right, so my last um, topic for sleep today is kind of what's what's the road forward for sleep research and what what big questions are still remaining in sleep neuroscience that both my lab and hundreds of labs around the world are trying to answer. So first, 
Although I spent an entire section discussing why neuroscientists believe that we sleep, I think there's still a lot of debate out there as to why we really sleep. Um, again, we spend about a third of our entire lives in a sleep state. So I think there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot more hypotheses that exist and a lot more that has to be studied to really explain why sleep is so important for us. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of the studies that look at sleep deprivation will be vital to this question because seeing what happens when we don't sleep enough and the neural and, and physiological outcomes, I think will be very telling. Um, you might've noticed that I didn't talk about dreaming at all. Um, dreaming is I think, you know, an extremely interesting part of sleep. Everyone, pretty much everyone does it. And we experience very sometimes weird and odd and detailed events during dreaming. And really nobody knows why we dream. There's, you know, some theories about it, but no one really knows why. A big reason why we don't know why is it's really hard to study. Um, you can't really do an MRI or an EEG to, to, you know, peer into someone's brain while they're dreaming. Right now, all we really have is asking somebody what they were dreaming about, which is not the best way to study it. So my hope is that we'll have better techniques soon to actually investigate dreaming, but I think right now it's a huge open question in sleep neuroscience. Um, next, and I've seen a lot of questions in the chat about this. Um, I, I mentioned that sleep is important for memory consolidation, but it's kind of weird to think about sleep as improving our memory because we're not actually consciously going through information when we're sleeping. So the, the, the scientists that study this believe that when we experience something in our day, there's some sort of memory replay that's happening in those neurons that encoded the actual memory, and that in turn kind of strengthens that memory. But that's kind of really all we know right now. And, and it's not really known the really detailed neural machinery that controls this. It's not really known you know, to what extent can we improve memory? Like, is it gonna help with Alzheimer's? Probably not, but can it improve the daytime? You know, if you, if you were just studying for a test during the daytime, can a good night's sleep improve memory for that information? Potentially, but there's, yeah, there's still a lot of open questions there. Um, I didn't talk about sleep rhythms too much, but when we do EEG, one thing that EEG tells us is that when somebody falls asleep, a lot of the elect electrical oscillations and rhythms in the cortex are vastly changing. That's the way that we actually can determine sleep stages is by looking at EEG rhythms. A lot of work is trying to figure out where these rhythms come from. It's thought that huge populations of millions of neurons might be firing in a very rhythmic pattern, which then generates these large rhythms that we can measure with EEG. But in terms of you know, which brain region is causing this rhythm or which groups of regions is causing this rhythm, we're really kind of, we're in a, in a gray area right now in neuroscience of what's happening. And lastly, I didn't talk about this at all, but there's this really cool phenomenon called local sleep. And what that is, is the idea that parts of your brain can be asleep while simultaneously other parts of your brain are actually awake. And we actually, we see this in EEG. You can see that certain parts of the brain have these sleep rhythms while other parts of the brain have rhythms that are characteristic of being awake. It's, it's kind of paradoxical because neuroscientists and people assume that if you're asleep, your whole brain's asleep. But it's actually, a, it's a very common finding that, that, that local regions of your brain might be asleep while others are awake. How that happens, why it happens is not very well known, but um, it's something that is, it is being actively researched. Um, there's many more questions that I could have put on this slide. Um, I think sleep is a really cool area of neuroscience because there's so much unknown about it. Um, and I think it's it's so important for our brain and body's health that it, I think it's really important to figure out what's happening during sleep. Um, but I think these are a few of the big questions that remain.
All right, so that's all the material I want to go over. I'm sorry if that was a lot. I know I went through a bunch of different material and, and different areas of neuroscience, but I just wanted to thank my lab in this picture, uh, my advisors, uh, Dr. Laura Lewis. Um, I have many collaborators, both at BU and at Mass Massachusetts General Hospital um, and Harvard and MIT, as well as the directors of my program. Um, all right, so thank you all for listening. And I'm sorry I didn't answer everyone's questions, but now is probably the best time for me to go into some of these uh, questions that you guys have. All right. Thank you for your insightful presentation. Uh, I think uh, that many of us found out some answers to their questions, but still I see in the chat indeed there are other questions and we still have time. So please, we'll, we'll be more than thankful if you could answer those. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry for everyone that asked questions early on, but I'm just going to go from the most recent questions up. Um, so is there damage from, is the, is the damage from sleep deprivation reversible? So this, the existing research that exists, or exists with sleep deprivation does suggest that you can reverse it. There is something known as sleep debt, where after having a poor night or several nights of sleep, the following nights of sleep might try to make up for that and to a certain extent can make up for it. I think severe sleep deprivation, where you're deprived of sleep for several days in a row, or you're not sleeping um, enough hours for you know, several days or weeks or months, months, I think on that scale, there's not much research, but I think it's, it's less reversible the longer you're deprived of sleep. Um, often people that will you know, come into our studies for the sleep deprivation studies, they'll experience a few days after that where they're still recovering from their, their lack of sleep, but eventually they will recover. Um, I'm not sure of any, any long-term, um, like any longitudinal studies that have looked at it just because I think it can be very detrimental and, and no, no university would, would approve a study where you have you know, a week plus of sleep deprivation. Um, but there might be some studies in animals that are worth looking at. Um, I'm gonna actually drop my email in the chat right now, just so everyone can take it, like write it down now and feel free to send e me an email with more questions. Um, I see a big, I see a question about how does the brain generate consciousness? That is a huge debated question that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna touch because I think people wouldn't, I think it'd just be too controversial, but it's a good question, but I don't know. Um, do you know what the general mechanisms are between different psychopathologies and changes in sleep patterns? So in terms of like MDD, so major depressive disorder, one of the hypothesized um, reasons is that in depression, ser the serotonin system is believed to be pretty deficient and serotonin is produced by a lot of those regions that are in the ascending arousal network. So if your serotonin system is deficient, it's likely that the many regions within the ascending arousal network are also deficient. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know of any studies that explicitly show that, but that would be my guess as to the connection between those two. Um, let me just keep going up. Um, let's see, why are some people sensitive to any external effects during sleep while others sleep heavily? That's a great question. So actually a side project of mine right now is looking at how, how visual stimulus might impact sleep and how the brain is functioning during that. So in this separate project, what we do is we have subjects in the MRI scanner try to fall asleep, but we also have a flickering light displayed to them while they're falling asleep. Most subjects are able to fall asleep, but one thing that I'm hoping to look at is how, if someone's a light sleeper and is, is woken up by this flashing of light, how brain activity in different regions might be causing that to happen. So it's a great question. I don't think we have any answers yet, but I am actually, I'm working on a project that might 
might give some answers to that. In what stage of sleep do people sleepwalk and how does that happen? Um, so I, hmm, I think that sleepwalking typically happens during non-REM sleep um, because during REM sleep, typically all motor output is silenced. That's why we don't often enact our dreams. So there, there are some, some studies that show that during REM sleep, a lot of the motor output that kind of would go to your spinal cord, from your spinal cord down to your, your like fingers and hands and legs, that's inhibited. But I believe during non-REM sleep, those aren't as strongly inhibited. So I'm pretty sure sleepwalking happens during non-REM sleep. As to why it happens and how, I think that's not as well known. Um, but I think, I think that is an area of research. Um, I'm not as well versed on it though. Um, how can I scientifically explain to my friend that loves to sleep 13 hours a day that it's unhealthy? <laughs> um, I, that's a good question. I'm not an MD, so I can't give you a medical reason, but I would say that typically it's recommended to sleep between like six to eight hours and anything more than that might, might be a sign that your, your brain and body requires more sleep. As to why they need more sleep, I, I can't say, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that, <laughs> but, but yeah, let's see. I think it's, so it's four o'clock now. I'll probably, I'll do one more question just to end things off. Um, so I'm just trying to find a question, I guess, towards the top. How does heavy snoring relate to sleep apnea if people have trouble uh, breathing during it? So I think the idea is that when people have trouble breathing, that is also what can cause snoring because your, your airway is not as open as when you're normally breathing. And then if you're having trouble breathing, sometimes you could have, um, you could miss a few breaths and that's what will cause you to wake up during sleep apnea. So I think snoring doesn't necessarily mean you have sleep apnea, but if you have sleep apnea and you already have trouble breathing, that often will contribute to, to snoring. Um, yeah. Okay, I think it might be best to end with questions there. Um, again, I put my email and I can, I'm happy to send it again if anyone missed it, but please feel free to email me any questions you have. Um, I, I think sleep neuroscience is a very cool area and I will more than happily answer your questions if you have any. Oh, Nicholas, thank you. I know for a fact I'll definitely send you some of my questions. And thanks everyone for attending, uh, our meeting. Uh, please, uh, I know I sent, uh, a link that is not working but if i'm mistaken uh, you must have uh, another link sent to you uh, within your uh, email in order to uh, get your certification of attendance and uh, i guess thanks everyone everyone for attending today a uh, special thanks for uh, nicholas and uh, ivy for helping me to moderate uh, and yeah have a great day evening night and remember to consolidate your memories while you sleep. Thanks. And yeah, good night's sleep. <laughs>